Thank you, Michelle, for being here with us. Okay, okay thank you very much, uh, Camila. So my, uh, my talk today is entitled The Tangled Dialectic of Body and Consciousness. It will be more philosophical, maybe a little bit more abstract, but a lot dealing nevertheless with experience. Um, in fact, I start from Varela's neurophenomenology. You know that Varela's neurophenomenology was conceived from the outset as a criticism and dissolution of the hard problem of the, the physical origin of consciousness. Indeed, according to Varela, the standard physicalist formulation of this problem is exactly, is precisely what generates it and turns it into a fake mystery. However, the neurophenomenological dissolution of the hard problem is very demanding for researchers. It invites them to leave their position of neutral observers or thinkers and to seek self-transformation instead. It leaves no room for the hard problem in the field of discourse and rather displaces this problem onto the plane of attitudes, maybe even of ways of being. As a consequence, Varela's dissolution of the hard problem of the origin of consciousness is usually either ignored or considered as just a dodge. How can we overcome this obstacle? And how can we restore the argumentative impact of neurophenomenology in the debate about the origin of conscious experience? By drawing from various resources of philosophy and from Varela's early work, I will propose here a metaphysical compensation for the anti-metaphysical premise of the neurophenomenological dissolution of the hard problem. Yet, this alternative metaphysics is designed to keep the benefit of a shift from discourse to ways of being, that is, which is the latent message of neurophenomenology. Even metaphysical positions about consciousness should be traced back to basic epistemic attitudes and basic experiences. Even metaphysical positions should adopt a reflective direction of inquiry and relax their naive striving towards sort of, uh, you know, external realm. Now, Kant's renewal of the concept of metaphysics can serve as a reference for us. According to Kant, metaphysics may adopt two diametrically opposite orientations. Metaphysics can be used as a guide for reason in its quest for knowledge about the recesses of the world. This is the first orientation, the traditional orientation of metaphysics towards the hidden causes of everything. But also, this guiding role can also only operate after reason has reflected on its own limit. And it's the second orientation of metaphysics. It's an orientation of metaphysics towards uh, the condition of possibility of any thinking about, you know, an external world. So there is the transcendent orientation and the so-called transcendental orientation. There is the orientation towards the outer world and the orientation to, which is reflective towards ourselves. Conversely, in a quest for knowledge, the epistemic attitudes predetermine the choice of metaphysics. For instance, adopting an objectifying attitude, which is typically, which is typical of you know, contemporary science makes us stick to the currently dominant monistic physicalist metaphysics. If what is deemed to exist is known other than the object-like targets that we can extract and stabilize out of the flow of our lived experience, then we are irresistibly led to think that our very lived experience must be a byproduct 
or an MP phenomenon of some such objects, for instance, the brain. Yet, science itself generates good reason to be skeptical about the objects of scientific study. The, cognitiv the cognitivist view of the act of knowing as an influx of information from the environment to the brain thus generates the celebrated Putnam's brain in a vat skeptical thought experiment. What if all these so-called external objects were just coherent patterns of excitation of our own neurons? And also, what if our own neurons were just, you know, fabrications out of our experience? As for the inactive view of knowledge, it construes such objects uh, as mere meaningful focal points of the embodied experience of an active cognizant subject that co-emerges with its cognized environment. When this doubt, this kind of doubt, is fully taken into account, one is bound to retreat to a phenomenological attitude. According to Husserl, the only domain of apodictic certainty, of absolute certainty, of which any claim of an existence would be performatively contradictory, is the domain of what he calls pure conscious life. By contrast, I quote Husserl, all positions taken towards the already given objective world must be deprived of acceptance or inhibited. This is famous epoche. The worlds of science and everyday life are then downgraded to the rank of mere phenomena that claim being. They are not, they claim being. Whereas pure conscious life namely pure experience, is raised to the rank of, I quote Husserl, the whole of absolute being. This complete reversal of the ontological hierarchy, namely, you, you know, what, what is deemed to be really existent according to physicalism, namely physical objects, is called to be just something that claims being, that is not absolutely uh, that, that is not absolutely, this complete re reversal of their ontological hierarchy then is usually dismissed as a variety of idealism. Husserl somehow endorsed such characterization of his philosophy, but he gave his variety of idealism a performative rather than doctrinal acceptation. Uh, I quote him, my idealism, he said, is not a metaphysical sub substruction, but the only possible and absolute truth of an ego recollecting itself on its own doing and its own ability to give meaning." End of quote. So dogmatic idealism can be seen as a reification of this performative idealism that is typical of a certain period of Husserl's philosophy. Beyond the extremes of monistic physicalism and performative idealism, one may wonder about the attitudes that lend plausibility to the two intermediate positions, either substance or property dualism, or on the other hand, neutral monism. Dualism from Descartes to Chalmers arises from a kind of flickering between the phenomenological and the natural attitudes associated with the fake ontologization of the phenomenological domain. The initial move of dualists, you know it, you know this, is phenomenological. Descartes thus started from the uncontrovertible presence of the cogito, namely, in fact, of pure experience. And Chalmers starts from the felt intimacy of lived experience. The problem is that these two dualists tend to convert their starting point in phenomenology, 
in experience into a new object or a new property in its own right. The first person cogito is, is spuriously converted into the third person res cogitans by Descartes. Yeah, in and, yeah, really. and lived experience in as a precondition of any ontology is spuriously converted into an additional ingredient of a physicalist ontology. Pan-experientialism, a variety of pan-psychism in which experience is taken as a, fur a further fundamental property of physical objects, falls in fact in the, in the same trap. Neutral monism associated with double aspect theories or psychophysical parallelism is a way to avoid the flickering of dualism between the phenomenological and the natural attitude, yet taking both of them very seriously. This approach, namely neutral monism, however, requires to adopt a sort of God's eye point of view located somewhere above both psyche and physis. When this is done, the two archetypal attitudes are seen as two complementary approaches to one and the same reality posited out there, such as Spinoza's substance, Spinoza's substance causa suis. A partial correction of the static uh, character of the God's eye viewpoint adopted by neutral monist doctrines can be reached by imposing a permanent circulation between the two attitudes, reaching one by way of the other and conversely. This dynamical process was called an Ouroboros of consciousness by Sebastian Verus in 2014. Here, a naturalization of phenomenology presupposes a phenomenologization of nature. One then enters into a continuous intellectual process in which one, moves, one move serves as a preparation for the other move, the reverse move. As Bertrand, Bertrand Russell would have it, I quote him, men will urge that the mind is dependent upon the brain or with equal plausibility that the brain is dependent upon the mind. End of quote. In other terms, consciousness is correlationally dependent upon the brain within a naturalistic framework, but the brain, as an object of perception and active handling for subjects, is constitutively dependent upon consciousness within a phenomenological framework. Conscious experience correlates with brain events, but the brain qua object is constituted out of a, careful, a carefully selected set of conscious experiences. Such dynamical version of neutral monism was illustrated by Raymond Ruyer, cosmic consciousness, and by Max Wellman's reflexive monism. Ruyer, Ruyer and Wellman's universe has neither inside nor outside. Its outside is projected by, by its inside, whereas its inside is immersed within its outside. Spatial temporal expanse and the objects in it are actively constituted by the subject's consciousness, whereas the subject qua bodily object is immersed in space-time. Thus, according to Wellmans, I quote him, while remaining embedded within and dependent on the surrounding universe and composed of the same fundamental stuff, each human equipped with perceptual and cognitive systems has an individual perspective on or view of both the rest of the universe and herself. However, it seems to me that the problem of neutral monism both in their static and dyna dynamic versions, is that they posit a false symmetry between consciousness and its objects. This symmetry is false because it is a purely intellectual construct. 
in which the constituted bodily objects and the constituting ob embodied consciousness are formally put on a par with one another. But whenever intellectual constructs are perceived as such, and one starts to realize the lived background of the process of conceptual construction, then the symmetry is lost. One then understands that the only coherent strategy is to dwell continuously within the lived process of constitution of an objective knowledge in present experience, instead of just simulating this constitution. We are thus drawn back to a phenomenological variety of idealism after a detour through reflective monism. This should not be a surprise for us, since even reflexive monism, uh, the doctrine of Max Velmont, arose from a phenomenological insight. Let me just read Velmont. I quote him, what I normally thought of as the physical world and my experience of the world are one and the same. According to Eugen Fink, I quote him, phenomenology simply claims that being is identical with the phenomenon, end of quote. One may be reluctant to adopt such an, an uncompromising phenomenological ontology, but one can hardly deny that the de facto basis for any ascription of being is the phenomenon, since claiming that something is necessarily that, sorry, since claiming that something is necessarily stems from evidence presented here and now in our embodied lived experience. In order to take this de facto experiential basis seriously without adopting a de jure phenomenological ontology and without falling back into a dubious naturalistic ontology either, a lucid alternative option was proposed by Maurice Merleau-Ponty. It consists in an ontology that retains absolutely nothing of the standard identification of beings with objects. It is an immersive ontology, an ontology of immersion, instead of an ontology for a distant gaze. Merleau-Ponty called it an endo-ontology, namely a discipline of what it is like to be, rather than a discipline of the contemplation of the contemplation of beings from a certain distance. Endo-ontology considers the phenomenon as a self-revelation of being, or as an effect of the self-splitting of the flesh of the world, as um, as um, Claire has quoted, out of which appearing appears, rather than the superficial manifestation of beings, namely of objects, that supposedly, supposedly exist beyond appearance. To clarify this discussion about some doctrines of consciousness, a good option is to develop the geometrical model or allegory of a client bottle. You remember this bottle, which is analogous to a, a Mobius um, ribbon. Uh, this bottle of which you know the, the top reconnects with the, the, the bottom. Three strategies can be used to describe such unusual bottle. External, internal, and hybrid. From outside it, from inside it, or somewhere in between. These three st strategies closely correspond to three approaches to the problem of consciousness. Among those we have just uh, discussed, uh, just, just before that. Respectively, neutral monism, one, phenomenology, two, and reflexive monism, three. Along with the external strategy of description of the Klein bottle, one just stares at the bottle from a distance and describes its 
shape as if it were the shape of an object, a distant object. By such description, one discloses what we may call the objective topology of the bottle. Here, the inner volume arises as a consequence of its delimitation by the surface of the bottle. And yet, the outer surface of the bottle is in continuity with its inner surface. This picture is close to neutral monism if we identify the substance of neutral monism, for instance, Spinoza's substance with the bottle. Then if we identify the inner concave surface of the bottle with consciousness and the outer surface of the bottle with the bottle. This is an analogy. A concise statement of this metaphor was given uh, very early in the 19th century by George Henry Lewes. I quote Lewes, mental and neural phenomena are similar to the convex and concave surfaces of the sh same shape, distinguishable yet identical, end of quote. If we now adopt the hybrid strategy, we must consider an ant walking on the surface of the bottle, the ant, you know, the little uh, insect. So we consider an ant that walks on the surface of the bottle. And we must then describe from a distance the surprising path of the ant that goes from the inside to the outside of the bottle without changing direction in, he, in its walk. This is analogous to reflexive monism that starts from the first person standpoint and then cogently describes the circulation between the first person and the third person standpoints as if it were from a distinct meta standpoint. So it's a sort of mixed um, view that mixes first person aspects with third person aspects. Finally, according to the internal strategy, one describes the path and tactile experiences of the surface ant exclusively from its own first person standpoint the first person standpoint of the ant and then reconstructs a topology namely the subjective topology by using the reports of of lived experience of the ant that walks on the surface of the bottle one is likely to discover that the subjective topology is isomorphic to the objective topology of the bottle. Yet, it would be wrong to take the subjective topology as an insider view of the objective topology. Here, indeed, it may well be the case that there is no objective nature of the bottle except what is reconstructed uh, from the subjective standpoint. Just as there is, by definition, nothing external to the universe except what is sometimes imagined by its insiders. Now, what about the status of neurophenomenology in this um, metaphor? How should this discipline be located in the system of metaphysical coordinates I have just drawn? Neurophenomenology has sometimes be seen, been seen as an extended variety of naturalism due to its association with uh, uh, the project of naturalizing phenomenology. However, Varela's way of naturalizing phenomenology is by no means tantamount to reducing lived experience to a property of natural objects, but rather to broadening the concept of nature so as to accommodate in it the irreducible status of lived experience. This goes beyond property dualism and pan-experientialism. Indeed, the latter content themselves with making room in the standard concept of nature for experience construed as an additional ingredient of it. Instead, neurophilology starts the whole process from experience. So, the only adequate characterization of neurophilology is to take it as a variety of phenomenology of embodiment. 
that's the reason why I have renamed it phenoneurology, because really phenomenology comes first here. Only then can one make sense of Verilla's insistence on the systematic discipline of phenomenological reduction as a preliminary step in the practice of neurophenomenology. Only then can one understand his claim that the phenomenological reduction brings us back to a region of experience where no substantial distinction is to be made between subject and object, between a subjective knower and the known objectified nature. So now I think I should stop. My, my talk was a little bit longer than that and my paper even longer, but I think it's enough for discussion for today. Thank you very much for your, your attention. <laughs>